anybody. And, and oh, they answer back. Good to, that's wonderful. Um, welcome to Pillow Talks. I'm Norton Owen, Director of Preservation. And as the title of this talk indicates, today we'll be celebrating Warren Davis, whose life and connections to the pillow will become evident in the course of this conversation. I'm joined here today by local historian Bernard Drew, who has lived in the Berkshires since 1977 and is a regular columnist for the Berkshire Eagle and other publications. He's written books on Great Barrington, Monument Mountain, and water-powered industry on the Housatonic River in the 18th and 19th centuries. Welcome, Bert. Thank you. Thank you. I want to, you know, in your book, Remarkable Deeds, uh, you write about several entrepreneurial black Berkshireites from the 18th through the 20th centuries, uh, especially those who, like Warren Davis, dealt with real estate. And I wonder if you can tell us how you came to that subject and, and tell us about these men whose, uh, whose connections have so many common threads. I came to the subject, I think, simply through an accumulation of anecdotes that strung together. And I'll describe for a little perspective. Warren Davis was a, a woodsman, a real estate broker, a sawmill owner, a buyer and seller of real estate. He was not the first of his race to do such. I've been able to identify um, an individual named Cuffy Van Skake, uh, who lived in the mid 18th century in southern Stockbridge, northern Great Barrington. He was the son of a Dutchman, a Dutch fur trader, Elias Van Skake. Elias Van Skake had in his household two individuals of African descent, Cuffy and Cuffy's mother, Nana. They were a family. So um, at a certain point, um, Elias filed a chattel deed, and a, the copy of it is to be found in Springfield, uh, essentially giving Nanny, Nana and Cuffy to themselves. In other words, he gave them their freedom. Wow. Cuffy worked with his father for a number of years bringing in horses and selling to the, the local natives. Um, after, his, after Elias died, Cuffey continued and was conversant in Dutch, his native tongue, so to speak, English. And he could get along with um, the members of the Mohican tribe who lived in Stockbridge. He was illiterate. He had a friend draw up any deeds that he had to sign. When he signed them, the signature is Cuffy Vinsky, Cuffy Negro, his mark. And in the center, he drew what is an Indian totem of a heron. His father's symbol was a deer, a stag on his rear feet. So he was, he was talking about multicultural. Jumping ahead uh, a generation to Pittsfield, There's another individual of African descent who operated a um, restaurant in, the, in two different railroad stations. His name was Festus Campbell. He was uh, born in the South, came North, was taken in by a doctor in Pittsfield. After the doctor died, Festus um, had sufficient means to open a restaurant. He had several restaurants in Pittsfield in different locations. He also opened a greenhouse. He also bought and sold real estate. He owned land on Pontusic Lake. He owned land on the hill in the back of the Big Y supermarket downtown. Um, he was very active in his, in various, in his church and in helping with other churches as well. Um, he ended up, um, Well, he didn't have a lot of money. He disappeared from the local record and turned up in, of all places, Olympia, Washington. 
you know, this is a matter of a local historian having convenient help. Our, young, our older daughter, Jessie, lives in Olympia, Washington, managed to track down not only where Festus is buried in the cemetery there, but when, when Donna and I were visiting a couple of years ago, through some further diligent research, identified the house that Festus lived, lived in out there. And it was, I think, 42 steps exactly. It's not there any longer. 42 steps exactly from where the state capitol building is now. So it was torn down when the state built a new capitol. I, I describe all this just to show that it's, it's probably surprising that black individuals were active in the real estate trade, and none was more active than Warren Henry Davis. At one, in his lifetime, he owned, and it'd be a wild guess, but I'm easily uh, lowballing it, he owned 10,000 acres of land in the Berkshires. And I'll get to the, to the interesting largest parcel a little later on. Yeah. The, the, but this is this is fascinating to me, and that you uh, have selected these three individuals really to to highlight in remarkable deeds, and that they do share this this remarkable um, consonant that the, that they each had real estate dealings that they were, and they that they were each black, and that they were each in Berkshire County at a much earlier point in time. It's, um, it's a fascinating trilogy of individuals, but I, I wanna get specifically to, to Warren Davis and talk about some of his early life because of course the fact that, they, that the three of them were uh, here in Berkshire County at one time though uh, might erase the fact that in fact um, Warren Davis was born elsewhere. So could you talk about his early life? I don't know a whole lot about his early life. He was born in Warrington, North Carolina, 1884. How he came to be in, come to Great Barrington, um, brings into it the story um, one of our town's better known uh, historical figures, William Stanley, the electrical inventor. Uh, Stanley in 1886 perfected an alternating current transformer, the, the prototype to the same transformers that are used all over the world today. Um, Stanley lived in Great Barrington, did his experiments there. Um, he became successful enough, he, he established his own factory in Pittsfield, moved there for a time, but um, you know, he was under underfinanced, ran into trouble, so he sold his business, moved back to Great Barrington, and he lived on an estate called Brookside, which is today Eisner Camp Institu Institute for Living Judaism. And uh, that's just just south of Great Barrington, just south of town. Mm -hmm. And in the summers, Stanley. While well, he started new factories in Great Barrington, he liked to vacation in North Carolina. And in some fashion that I have not found documentation for, he met Warren Davis there. Um, Warren Davis was about 5, 10, or 11, thin as anything, very personable, and an excellent handler of horses. And William Stanley ended up bringing Warren Davis back to Great Barrington with him by around 1902. First mention of Warren I found in newspapers in, is in 1903 when one of William Stanley's horses um, stumbled in the field, injured itself, and had to be put down. So Warren Davis was sent to Ontario to buy a new team of horses. Well, that's trust in a 16, 17, 18 year old. Yeah, that's, I mean, if you can do the math, if he was born in 1884, in the early 1900s, 1902 would, or yeah, 1903, he would not yet have been 20 years old, and he would have have moved already from North Carolina to the Berkshires in order to uh, assist William Stanley. He lived at Brookside. Mm -hmm. um, he he cared for the horses. He also served as coachman 
drove team when Stanley or his wife wanted to go somewhere. The, Stanley thought sufficient of him that he sponsored Warren Davis attending what's now the University of Massachusetts to take a program, agricultural program. Um, turned out to be a, an eight week course in dairy farming. While Warren Davis is there, there's a fire at Brookside destroying the mansion. Stanley's have to move elsewhere in town. By the time Warren Davis gets back, there's no more Brookside, no more farm, no more horses. Um, he stays with the Stanleys for a while at a, at a mansion that was at the time on Maple Avenue in Great Barrington called Chestnut Wood. It was later torn down and there's a nursing home, was a nursing home on that site. Um, Stanley toyed with opening up, he owned a couple of other farms and toyed with, with this doing farming, but then he, he himself became interested in buying and selling real estate. So. Warren Davis struck off on his own and began to, he bought a house lot on Fairview Terrace in Great Barrington and then in a few years he bought a little strip of land on what's now Anderson Street, just down from where we live in Great Barrington. And he started buying and selling house lots. That didn't do marvelously well, but he had a knack for it. He started buying wood lots or buying rights to cut off wood lots. And he went after this with a vengeance, and he'd get contracts, supply such kind of, you know, whether it's railroad ties or, or pilings or, uh, or kind of large wooden objects. So just to uh, be clear on what you're talking about with the woodlot, this would be a, a, a piece of land that he would buy specifically so that the wood, the, that the he timber could, could be harvested off it and sold. And then he would sell the and lot. And then he would sell the lot. Or he would buy, you know, a year or two's rights to do that. Mm -hmm. It'll, um, he became a successful enough businessman that in... 1915, he was invited to speak at the National Negro Business League convention in Boston. And he spoke, and I have to read the topic if I have it. My success as a dealer in railroad ties, telegraph poles, pilings, etc. <laughs> well, it was of interest to 700 attendees. Wow. And the president of that organization at the time was um, a familiar name, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington gave the opening address. It's not a stretch to think that Warren Davis may have met Booker T. Washington. Yeah. And a second really interesting connection. Um, and again, with for a little math, at that point in 1915, he still would have been 21. Yeah, in his. But he's. 31, right? 30s, yeah. But he's a success, successful yeah, businessman already. A already. Successful businessman well, come 1920, he's really feeling energized. Keep in mind that buying and selling woodlots is not an easy thing in the South Berkshire, particularly given the number of uh, charcoal harvesting sites to supply charcoal to our iron furnaces or iron furnaces in Lenox. West Stockbridge, uh, Housatonic, and then a string of them down through Connecticut. So a lot of the activity to cut charcoal wood was on the mountaintops by now. The lowlands are all already cleared, of course, for agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and so at one time or another, Warren Davis owned or had rights to cut off um, land on the southern end of Monument Mountain and on the northern end. The northern end um, ended up belonging to Dr. Charles McBurney, Cherry Hill. If you know Cherry Hill Road and that, is, that estate, well, Warren Davis cleared some of that land, sold it to McBurney. The southern part of Monument Mountain is, is now part of Monument Mountain Reservation. Um, you know, Davis ran into a trouble now and then uh, for example, a forest fire really threatened uh, his, his big harvest one year. Mm -hmm. 1920, he's ambitious. Uh, there was a, another Great Barrington traction engineer um, named Fred Pearson, lived on, had an estate, his estate still there on Long Pond, is now 
American Institute for Economic Research. Um, Pearson and his wife died on the Lusitania. Pearson had one ambition, which was to create an enormous game preserve. And he started out to do that th through cutoffs, buying up all sorts of land on Beartown. If you're familiar with this portion of Great Barrington, Stockbridge, Lee, Monterey, up on the hill, up on the mountain. You only see it if you go to the state forest today. Pearson's son was, wanted to sell all of that land, and it would, he would really would like to sell it all of a piece, one piece. It, it was made up of a lot of old small farm, home, farmsteads, homesteads. Warren Davis turned out to be the only person really willing to acquire the whole caboodle, mm -hmm. nearly 5,000 acres, wow. which Warren Davis purchased in 1924, $23,500. Give, give or take. Uh, excuse me. He purchased it for $28,000. Within six months, he sold it to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for state forest for 23000 and change. So that sounds like a loss of $5,000. You say, well, this is a smart businessman. <laughs> yeah, how smart was he? He retained 10 years of timbering rights. Whoa. So. He had the land, he had a mortgage, but he got out of the land. He set to hiring crews, at least one reference I found, he hired a crew of mostly Italian laborers, but whoever would work in the woods, he, they, um, this was still, this is borderline, mostly the era of the horse teams still in the woods. They created woods roads all over the top of the mountain. They brought out all sorts of wood, and we've already heard what a lot of it was used for. And he milked that for actually, um, well, he went past the 10 years. The Commonwealth thought he should only have been there nine years. And so, you know, there's a little discussion there, but he did all right. And by the time he's done, 1930, he is in a position to buy the old Berkshire Street Railway car house on the Sheffield Great Barrington line. And he sets that up as a sawmill. So now he's he sourced a product um, businessman. He, in other words, he cuts his own lumber, saws it up and, and provides it to, to the various ones who were um, going to be his customers. 1925, I'll introduce another individual of whose name you should recognize, William Edward Burghardt Du Bois, Great Barrington native who um, became a remarkable civil rights activist. Um, du Bois was born in Great, Great Barrington, spent some of his childhood years on his grandfather's farmstead on Route 23, Egremont Plain. And there were a number of Du Bois kin still around South Berkshire. So he would come, you know, W.E.B. would come back from time to time to visit. And I have not found the exact purpose, but it's, he apparently was in town in 1925. And apparently somehow, not W.E.B., but his wife, Nina, got the attention of Warren Davis, who said, I, I want to show you a building lot. Well, at that time, Warren had just finished cutting off wood on a section, the northern section of June Mountain. I'm probably mentioning places you may not be you know familiar with, but June Mountain is mostly um, in Sheffield, east of the Housatonic River, um, and it's very rugged hillside. Mm -hmm. There was one farmstead up on that a portion of that mountain that I'm aware of. I know that I'm familiar with the section that Davis cut off because of a different research I was doing into the William Taylor Day Forest Area, which is a property of Berkshire Natural Resources Council. That's the same property that Warren Davis owned. Um, the only portion of that property that's down near a road is about a half acre next to a stream. And it was a site in 1902 when there was a the threat of an outbreak of uh, smallpox in town that a hastily built hospital was constructed on this little property. 
the foundation is still there. If that's what he showed Mrs. Dubois, well, but anyway, he kept pressing W.E.B. Well, I'll, I'll hold on to this property for you, and I, I'm sure you'll want it sometime. And I could split it off from the mountain behind if you want. Yes, it would have been possible to get up to the top of the mountain, but you had to go around and up and over. I mean, Warren Davis was not one to pass up opportunity, either to acquire <laughs> good property or to, to sell it. And the, uh, earlier said he probably owned 10,000 acres of land at one time or another. At his death, he owned not, none of that, of course. Mm -hmm. He didn't intend to. Uh, he wasn't out to enrich himself. Um, so getting back to the, 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 the whole, the, the, the large land tract that he had that became, so that is now what is Beartown State Forest? Correct. It's, it's even larger now, up to about 10,000 acres. But yes, the, the heart of Beartown State Forest was uh -huh. the old Pearson estate that Warren Davis owned for six minutes, you know. So, <laughs> so is there any um, recognition of that in, in the Beartown, um, at, at Beartown, for instance, or it only is the historians like yourself uh, who have brought that narrative forward? I would have to answer the latter. Yeah. Uh, no, there's no mention of Fred Pearson mm -hmm. or the homesteads up there. I mean, yes, the, the town historians have kept track. Mm -hmm but there's no acknowledgement that I'm aware of, of, of any of these uh, connections on Beartown. Well, I, I guess I ask because one of the things that I feel like we're, um, uh, that, that everyone is complicit with us today in doing, which I'm very excited about, is that we're bringing his name forward, you know, and, and in a way that can be institutionally visible in ways that, that perhaps haven't always been. Um, I hope that that will be something that will uh, take the, all of this um, detective work that you have been doing over the years and and move that forward as well, because there seems to be, um, you know, uh, always the need to tell some of the lesser told stories to to uh, to bring out the the people who really did make it possible to do what we are doing today. It really seems like, from what you're saying, that the, that, um, that Beartown Forest um, would not be there in, in the way that it is, uh, that, that Warren Davis's contribution there was uh, remarkable, too. Yes, I could add that the reason Warren Davis got a lower price for the land was the state at the time was only paying $5 an acre. He knew that. And he did all this figuring ahead of time. He knew it was going to look like a paper loss. And a quick finish to the Du Bois mm -hmm. uh, story. In 1928, friends gave Du Bois, as a 60th birthday gift, his grandfather's homestead. And while Du Bois would not buy the land that Warren Davis wanted to sell him, mm -hmm. he did engage Davis to, to be an in, intermediator and engage um, stonemason and others to start doing work to restore the old homestead. The house at that time was still standing. Um, and this is the property on Route 23 that still is, well, is now even um, a landmark of, of some kind, it's, right? It's been a national historic landmark since 1979. Mm -hmm. And it's now a parking lot and a self-guided tour. And you can visit the old his grandfather's old Burghardt homestead, but there's no, the buildings are gone. Mm -hmm. um, two boys in 1925, I, I started to say, and I uh, had gotten in touch with Warren Davis asking for biographical information and a photograph because he was thinking of putting something in the crisis magazine about Davis. Mm -hmm. um, the Davis Du Bois relationship kind of fizzled because uh, the Great Depression struck. Du Bois didn't have funds any longer. Um, Davis was busy enough with, with other things going on. And so that, that lapsed, but it's, it's yet another and interesting connection. Warren Davis had an office in Great Barrington. He lived on Rossiter Street in Great Barrington. That house is still there. Warren Davis had a connection with the Clinton African, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, um, 
for a time holding the deed to the, to the church building. And there's, there's a story that could take a half hour in itself. Um, I think we, it's about time to jump forward to the 1941-42. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, um, the, the, the connection that we are really um, calling attention to here. Warren Davis you know, eventually sold the sawmill, but he stuck with uh, buying and selling real estate. And Norton and I have been unsuccessful in identifying some of the connections, but Ted Sean had a, an inspiration. He wanted to build a theater here in Beckett. And he engaged a Stockbridge engineer designer, Joseph Franz, uh, to help with that work. And I don't know how, but Joseph Franz um, must have been aware of Warren Davis. I have to study some of the drawings and blueprints. Maybe it's specified. Yeah. These beams come from yes. Warren Davis specifically. And I do want to point out that we have some Franz family members with us too. Uh, the two daughters of Joseph Franz and his grandson as well are with us today. Uh, and, and, thank you. and I will say that there is one really great hint in um, Joe Humphrey wrote a wonderful book about her dad, um, and there is a photograph in that book showing the beams that he created for the theater uh, that are in front of uh, our stone dining room uh, and main uh, and main house, uh, now called Hunter House. So they are lying there where they were presumably, that's where they were hand hewn. But I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a bit in the story, but because we, what we don't know, I guess, is exactly how that connection was made between Joseph Franz and Warren Davis. But clearly it was made, and you know more also about the, um, about where Warren Davis sourced the, the, well, the lumber from. I'm going by, I think, Ted Sean's writing, but, uh, piecing things together, I could see that Warren Davis would have had a reputation that Joseph Franz would have recognized, because if he wanted certain timber beams and long ones of a certain size, they were not in great supply any longer. And the Berkshires have, I've just told you <laughs> how much the, the woods were cut off. And apparently they, these timbers, um, came from New Lebanon, New York, just over the border. Uh, it wasn't enough that a tree could be tall. It had to be of a big diameter, uh, a whole length of it. Mm -hmm. And hand hewing, I don't want to ruin a story, but I can't picture the poor <laughs> Warren Davis did this all by himself. Mm -hmm. He could, he, yeah. would, he was, you know, quite capable of it. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that we have as uh, evidence also at the, these days, the, the photograph that's on the um, poster right outside the door of, uh, from today of Warren Davis holding the ax, and that's the, that's the ax that he would have used on those beams. He he's also can be seen, there's a group photograph uh, right behind us here of the gentleman who built the Ted Schwann Theater along with Joseph Franz holding the plans for it. He's the one you can see holding the plans. And then Warren Davis is kneeling down with the ax uh, beside it. So you all can go up and, and look at this after, after the talk to, to see that a, in a little closer up. There's another photograph in a display case in the other room of Warren Davis gathered with a group of the workmen. He's in a nice suit and tie. The workmen are all like me. It's just, you know. And only today did I confirm a suspicion I had that I just have to blab about, talk about connections. In this, in either photo, you'll see a, a man with a full head of hair, tall Italian man. His name was Joseph Arienti. He lived in Great Barrington. We live in the Joseph Arienti house in Great Barrington. <laughs> I did not know that for sure until today. 
we're getting to witness uh, so, a, a historian's discovery. I'm here. thrilled yeah. uh, to be asked to do this today because yeah. now I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, I'll tell you how. Uh, tell share with everybody else how this occurred uh, because Bernie was looking at the photograph that is displayed of of these gentlemen, and he picked out the one that he wanted to know who it was. Now, these are all people who've been dead for many, many years. Uh, Warren Davis himself died in 1960. Um, so, uh, but I remembered having just recently seen a version of that photo in a book that Ted Sean put together called How Beautiful Upon the Mountain, in which, I'm so glad he did this, he identified every single man that was in, the, in these photos. And these are not names that are known to us, um, much like Warren Davis's name, but you know, again, the power of carrying it forward, making sure it's written down, making sure that it might be in a book or somehow documented so that a future generation knows, so that you know whose house you're living in. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Warren Davis's business career kind of wound down. I should mention that he had a live-in housekeeper bookkeeper, office manager, um, Mabel Gunn. And in the 1940s, they took a, for a short time, took another direction entirely. They opened a roadhouse in Craryville, New York, the Harlem Inn. It was right beside the Harlem Railroad line going, that was going to uh, Chatham, New York. And this is best I can find for a Warren Davis connection with dance. They at times would have live bands and dancing at the Harlem Inn. <laughs> and I, I'm sure he was a good stepper. You know, yeah. he, he, just, he just had to have been. Well, this seems like a good opportunity. Also, you're mentioning the guns. Uh, I, we have with us today Ray Gunn, uh, who is the nephew of uh, the aforementioned Mabel Gunn. And I wonder, if, Ray, if you could come up to the microphone here and maybe share a memory or two about, uh, about Warren Davis. So I want, and, and it, by way of introduction, I want to mention that Ray is the head of the board of the Clinton Church Restoration, the, uh, the church that Bernie mentioned uh, that is now under being reconstructed in Great Barrington. Um, and so, and, and also to be a representative of the family. We are very honored to have you with us. No matter what you say, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had the uh, pandemic and uh, everything else is going on. And I just feel good that I'm healthy and my wife takes care of me. So what else could you ask for? <laughs> you know, my Uncle Warren, and that's what we used to call him. My Uncle Warren was, he was quiet when he was around in a crowd. He didn't say much, but uh, he knew a lot. And I can remember, um, he, I either saw him, we had uh, the gun homestead, used to be in uh, Stockbridge, up on uh, East Main Street. And uh, we'd all meet up there, and Uncle Warren would be there, and he would have his significant other, my, uh, aunt, my Aunt Mabel. And uh, we would all have a good time. Now, you, have, uh, you probably don't know that my Aunt Mabel was, uh, number four of 10 children to my grandfather and his wife. And uh, my mother was the oldest of 14. Uh, so you see, when we all got together, uh, <laughs> the old, the old uh, family reunion was pretty big. <laughs> and I can remember talking to Uncle Arnold uh, a few times and I was always curious on just how they do it. You know, I walk out in the forest and I don't know one tree from another. <laughs> and all he had to do was walk through. 
and get through with this path on their journey. And he could tell you about everything he saw. I think that's miraculous. Sometimes I forget my wife's name. <laughs> and uh, he was remembering all this stuff. And, and then he used to tell me about how he owned a mountain. Okay. You know, when you own that much land, it's got to be a mountain. And he said, um, Ray, it's all in how you do it. There's some things on that mountain that I don't want, and there's a lot of good stuff up there. He said, I want the good stuff, so I got to take the bad with the good. And that's what he did. And as uh, was related to you, over the years, he got his money back. Uh, by uh, having the right to cutting the wood. And it always made him feel good to talk about those things. Now, you talk about them, uh, the, the little place they opened up over there in New York State. And uh, that was dance night, Saturday, <laughs> Saturday weekend night. In fact, if you went down uh, Route 23 there, there were cars parked around the end and out in the street. But everybody had a good time. And uh, he, he owned that for quite a few years until it finally went down. Now, I'm not sure when he died, uh, but I, I know um, at the Gun Homestead in Sheffield, then and Stockbridge. We used to meet every year. And there was one year that we met, I wish I could remember the year, and he wasn't there. And everybody missed him. And we couldn't just couldn't figure out what had happened. But then uh, our Mabel told us that he had passed away uh, during the year. And so it was, that was one of the saddest family reunions that we had. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we used to have it up in Stockbridge. And the house was located just as you turn the corner by the Berkshire Theater there. Mm -hmm. Turn the corner, go down the hill, we used to be on the right. Still and there. Still there. It's <laughs> yeah, and uh, that used to be a gun home said we had. Uh, Five of the siblings born there, and uh, I was I was born in the South, but my father was born in school. But it doesn't matter because I've been up here since uh, 1942. It's a long time, longer. Well, I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but but born when you stop and think about think about it. He was the only black person that had this, that worked in this type of business in the North, and he controlled the destiny and the lives of so many people. I would say, and now I don't have this as a fact, I would say that any lumber man here in Berkshire County must have had a start with my Uncle Warren because Uncle Warren owns his own lumber yard. He had all of the equipment that he needed to take down big trees, to saw them up and all of that. And, and it's nice to know that I know, or oh, we're slightly related to him in his years. And it's always given me a great deal of pleasure when somebody mentioned my Uncle Warren and right away it just brought back memories of him and uh, how he used to tell about the woods and the forest and things like that. Oh, by the way, he went to UMass, which was an agricultural school. Mm -hmm. I did too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I graduated in 1952 and uh, it's been a long time. So that's a lot, it means a lot for me and I feel proud to be able to talk a little bit about it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
So I wanted to ask, are there any closing thoughts that you have, uh, Bernie, about, about Warren Davis, things that we haven't touched on, things that, um, that sum up his, his career or his uh, achievements? Well, Ray put it pretty well. <laughs> Warren Davis, self-taught, could go into the woods, study the trees, figure out the cordage or the, you know, the board feet in, mm -hmm. just by walking around how many trees, and then it's sufficient to, to uh, make a real business of it. I just, you know, Warren Davis had a darker side. He smoked a pipe. <laughs> When I did my research a dozen years ago, I, I talked with a you know, good number of people who knew him, several lumbermen, as Ray points out, they all had good things to say. Um, and several, several mentioned that he smoked a pipe. Ray was sharing that, um, that he lost most of his teeth and that he had a perfectly spaced gap in his teeth to, in which he could hold his pipe. Now, I mean, he didn't just smoke a pipe. He smoked furiously because a lot of research, I, I studied deeds. And there's one deed I came across. A woman was selling timber rights. And it's spelled right out in the deed. And there shall be no smoking anywhere near the barns. So you could picture when Warren Davis visited, he was puffing away. And, and the woman got <laughs> quite nervous about the whole thing. Yeah. Ultimately, I just, you know, Warren Davis was a all-around guy. Uh, had, had to uh, look out for his own business interests, succeeded reasonably well, got into, you know, occasional financial binds, but uh, made so many interesting connections. It's hard to picture anyone else with, with that range of connections, but Warren Davis, and, and not the least... Uh, to the construction of the Sean Theater here. Well, exactly, and I will say that the you know the the work of Warren Davis has already been enshrined in the Ted Sean Theater, and with the recent renaming of the Welcome Center, uh, the Warren Davis Welcome Center, his name will also live on here. And I want to point out that uh, this renaming was instigated by one of our trustees. Jenny Kasanoff, who's with us here today. Uh, Jenny's been a champion of our efforts with the Berkshire community uh, and her support for efforts like this, which connect our past and our present, are both essential and greatly appreciated. So, So I want to thank you, Jenny. I thank you, Bernie. I thank you, Ray. And I thank all of you for witnessing this here today, which really helps us bring on and carry on Warren Davis's name to next generations. So thank you very much for being with us today.